777777777777777777777777777777777777777777777777777777777777777777777777777777777777777777777777777777777777777777777777777777777777777777777777777777777777777777777777777777777777777777777777777777777777777777777777777777777777777777777777777777777777777777777777777777777777777777777777777777777777
sorry. I don't want to be Give around me, people and giving them a fucking shit about how I'm feeling. I hope the public wrote me out because I don't want to be here. I fucking hate it. I fucking hate living with these two-faced And because I don't suck people's fucking assholes. I'm up for eviction every week. But I ain't sucking asshole. I'm not gonna suck fucking assholes. The only real difference between the more mainstream reality shows such as Big Brother compared to the considerably more target marketed Ultimate Fighter is that the participants are solely made up of professional MMA fighters. Not only that, but they are each put into a single elimination tournament in which they must compete against each other, with the winning prize being a six-figure contract with the UFC, the world's leading MMA promotion. To put in simpler terms, 16 guys live in a house together for six weeks and they all fight in a cage every few Few days until just one victor remains that's the entire show in a nutshell so it would this is a good concept to be fair i've never heard of this show but it sounds entertaining it sounds like something i would watch and i don't give a fuck about ufc or whatever but come is no surprise that some of the characters that voluntarily put themselves in this situation aren't exactly the most mentally stable of individuals Jesus. When you're juicing, it fucks with your mind a lot, by the way. It makes you really aggressive. Really agitated, really irritated. Just on a quick side note, it really is a shame the producers decided to put pretentious and dramatic music over this segment, as it somewhat takes away from the unintentional comedic brilliance of the moment. It's characters like this, of which there have been many, that have made the show one of the most popular in the world among the 18 to 25 male demographic. The program can make anyone a viral sensation for both the right and wrong reasons. Heroes and villains alike have become superstars of the UFC via this route of indoctrination. Jeez. One of whom was 26-year-old John Copenhaver, AKA War Machine, who started off the show as one of the least popular contestants. His first few segments of airtime consisted of him either getting drunk, destroying property, fighting with other contestants, or making crude and indelicate remarks over a multitude of sensitive topics. He acted in a brash and somewhat primitive manner throughout the first half of the series, yet he managed to turn things around in episode 8, as he finally the course of a single episode. And although he lost his fight via close decision and was eliminated in the first round, he remained a favorite from that moment on, and was even given a second chance at the show's pay-per-view final where he faced off against another popular contestant. The fight essentially guaranteed the winner a place in the UFC and losing in the show could now be redeemed for one of them but they needed to he switches look at that and he's mounted Jay Rock's in big trouble War Machine also has a place to the Jay Rock's in he won it it's all over what a turnaround John Copenhaver wins what a fight War the fight game is closely associated with the notion of mountaintops and valleys. The highs are so incredibly high, yet the lows are equally as low. And this requires an all-or-nothing approach to life. To win it all, you have to risk it all. Imagine training for months on end for an occasion that lasts 15 minutes at the most, and the outcome of that occasion means everything. If you win, there won't be many things that compare to the elation of that moment. But if you lose, the emotional pain can be devastating and many have correlated the feelings with total despair and hopelessness. The fight game is essentially a complete gamble, not just from a physical and financial standpoint, but from a psychological and what some would consider a spiritual one too. This is true of every professional level anything. You're, you're giving everything to do it. This is why I kind of like, I, I don't, I mean, I like things like Remember the Titans or like the inspirational movies are very fun, but I also like the other end of it, the, like the black swans and the whiplashes because they show that like, this is like the, the level that you have to go to, the, the amount of commitment you need is, is almost, is, it is self-destructive, but for some people, you know, they, uh, I guess they collapse in on themselves and become a beautiful star and everyone else just blows up into a supernova and dies, right? Yeah. To be great, 
you must take great risk, and the long-term odds will be heavily stacked against you. The consequences you. of losing and fighting doesn't compare to the other professions? I, that, I wouldn't believe you. I, I, I'm pretty sure the consequences of, it's not just about a single fight. It could be a game, it could be somebody that spends their entire high school and then college career trying to go pro in football or basketball. I'm pretty sure for like most athletic events, probably for a lot of art related stuff, like it's probably going to be similar. That would be my guess. Like the, a, everybody, if you get fucked going for the best, you've dedicated like the best years of your life. That sounds really depressing when I say that, not to discourage anybody, but you've, you've spent the best years of your life chasing a dream that once it's gone, once you lose that, Destiny doesn't know what the fuck he's talking about. I mean, I was a semi-professional gamer. I went to school for music. I'm like a decently intelligent person. If I'm wrong on something, Lionel89, feel free to let me know, buddy, but I've probably gotten to higher places in my life across multiple things and you'll get in any one thing in your life. So, you know, if you don't trust me, whatever. But regardless, um, the, the the hardest part about trying to make it in like these types of athletic events is if you get close and you don't do it, you have absolutely nothing to show for it, which is probably what I would imagine would be like some of the hardest, um, some of the hardest things to deal with. Like, I, <clears throat> I have a feeling, and I could be wrong because I don't have first-hand experiences, but I have a feeling that nobody gives a fuck if you were a D1 college player if you don't go to the NFL. Nobody gives a fuck how good you were at college ball if you don't play in the NBA. You're never leveraging that into a job. You're never, you're, you're doing nothing. You've, instead, you graduated with probably an MBA, and then hopefully you can go on and do something else. But everything that you've put the best and strongest years of your life towards now amounts to nothing, and you can't do anything with it. Like, yeah, it's, that's hard. That's rough, I think. Um, not to say it's good or bad, or I'm not making a judgment statement. I'm just saying that like there's a huge sacrifice that goes into um, this type of stuff. Okay, but fighting in NFL, you leave a lot on the field or in the ring physically. The results of losing are beyond arts. Not saying dedication is different. Um, I mean, maybe. It depends on what you're talking about. I'm trying to think. I wonder if... I wonder if it's better for your health to be a bad fighter or a good fighter. If I had to guess and I didn't know, I would guess that the better fighters probably do worse. I would actually bet I would actually bet that almost for sure that the better fighters probably do better. Because if you're a bad fighter, how many fights do you get? How many fights do you get scheduled for and then you're done? Whereas if you're a good fighter, how long is your career? How many times do you step in the ring, right? Like, I'm willing to bet that there are a lot of shitty high school and college football players that don't have as much brain damage as people that play in the NFL for a decade, right? Like, the, what, the, when it comes to, like, brain damage and shit, like, that shit is cumulative. Like, it adds up over time, you know? You can be a successful fighter like Floyd Mayweather, who rarely gets hit. Sure, if you're, like, really, 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 really good. <clears throat> But I think that I think Floyd Mayweather is like the exception, not the rule, right? You still fight lower level fights with less safety? Yeah, maybe. Brain damage can sometimes make you smarter. I used to bang my head against the walls of childhood and unlock hidden pathways in my brain. <laughs> yeah. Good one, dude. Floyd says, I worked hard, Omega lol. His father put him in gloves and taught him not to get hit since he was three. I mean, that's still working hard, right? What do you mean? <laughs> I, I don't understand what that statement would be. Sorry, okay. Do you. John Copenhaver had reached the mountaintop on this occasion, yet his descent into the valley would soon follow. 
His next fight took place on May 24th of 2008, and he was submitted just 56 seconds into the first round. He was released from the UFC and had multiple run-ins with the law soon after. He was eventually charged with two counts of assault, the first of which was for choking a man unconscious in a parking lot. To have that image out there that a fighter is choking people out is scary. Well, but that's nice to choke him out, because if we wanted to, we could smash their whole body apart. So a choke is nice and quiet, nice and peaceful. You take a little nap and you wake up, you know, harm done. You know, on the other hand, you smash from the pieces, and they, you know that really hurt. So that's a nice way out. The second assault charge was. That's probably true. Depending on if I had, if a UFC fighter wanted to fuck me up, and he would have choked me out. He choked me out. I wake up. Whatever. I would prefer that a million times over striking or other shit. That, but. I mean, I mean, obviously they could also choke you out and then just kill you afterwards too. But like, te technically, he's not wrong. But I, I mean, the, there's also like a million variables there as well of what happened, right? Was for rendering a bouncer unconscious at a nightclub. There's always a little bit of tension between us. He's a big dude, probably like six four, three hundred twenty pounds, big giant dude. And that night in particular, uh, we had words. It kept escalating. You know, he was gonna beat me up. I was gonna beat him up. We're talking shit, talking shit, talking shit. And eventually, it got to the point where it's like, well, what's up? And he's like, what's up? You know, do something. He's telling me to do something, do something. Egg me on, egg me on, egg me on. Kind of challenging me. You want to fight? I'm like, dude, you don't want to fight me. So yeah, come on, let's do it. Come on, let's do it. We did it. Although it sounds like if he's the one that's instigating fights, that paints that in a little bit of a different light, which it kind of sort of sounds like he is. He lost. It was only one punch. I didn't, you know, I didn't terrorize him. One punch. He lost. I won. I got in trouble. Had I lost... I would have went home, went to sleep, woke up and said, I'm not going to do that again. Too. Some people are a little bit different. They like to pick fights and they like to, you know, call the cops. So, you know, that, that's his problem. In a surprising display of leniency from the court, he was only sentenced to three years probation with 30 days of community service. He knew he was extremely lucky not to get jail time, and this allowed him to resume his career in MMA and attempt to rise once more. He openly stated that his plan was to fight in small town shows against low-level opponents in the hope that a long winning streak and improved record would allow him to return to the UFC. He had a clear-cut goal, along with the blueprints on how to get there, and everything started going according to plan. Ariel Hawani for FanHouse.com being joined by MMA fighter War Machine and War Machine, you are on an impressive three-fight winning streak as of late. You feeling uh, a little more comfortable in your MMA career now? Uh, you know what, dude? It's uh, you know, I belong in the big shows. You know what I mean? So I've been going around and you know, uh, beating up these you know, undefeated hometown heroes like uh, De La Renzi up in Canada and uh, Rashad Woods on D in DC. And uh, I mean, uh, these are just guys that. Uh, that uh, I sh I'm supposed to be, you know what I mean? I mean, I'm the real deal, dude. You know, uh, I'm not a I'm not a scrub, so I'm just uh, you know, I'm just gonna keep keep on kicking ass until I uh, get back into the UFC or back into a big show. At this moment in time, the UFC required a six to one win to loss ratio to even be considered for a contract. This meant John had to win three more fights to get another shot. He would win the next two one by submission and the other by technical knockout, but then lose the third via a close fought split decision. This loss would have been a very hard pill to swallow as it essentially meant he would have to start from scratch. Not quite at the bottom, but not far from it. The momentum he had built was now gone despite all the work it took to get there. It would have been a remarkably harsh dose of reality when he woke up the next morning and he appeared to go off the rails soon after. Prosecutors played surveillance video from in and outside Thrusters Lounge in Pacific Beach. It immediately knocked me back. I, I grabbed from my mouth and kind of fell backwards on, onto my, my butt. And it took me a few seconds to, to kind of come out of my daze. Bouncer Matthew Compton said the UFC fighter War Machine, who had his name legally changed from John Copenhaver, punched him several times Jesus. in the mouth. Compton said he was dazed, his lip was split, and two of his teeth loosened. Seconds later, he said the brawl moved outside where another security camera 
captured the action. Beyond aggressive. Uh, 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 crazy, almost. That's the best way I can describe it. Just, he was seeing nothing else. He was rendered a term of one year to be served at the San Diego County Jail, but was granted a two-month delay before starting his sentence. He reportedly used this time to mainly go out and party, but also managed to cram in one final fight just days before his surrender date. Had a tough battle with John Alessio. Match didn't go your way. Care to reflect on it? Uh, you know, I actually did a lot better than I thought I was going to do. I, uh, I pretty much knew I would lose, unless I got a lucky knockout. I uh, trained for five days for the fight. I'm in the worst shape I've ever been in my whole life. <laughs> but I was like, oh man, it was a weird uh, mental game to go into this fight. Usually I'm confident I think I'm going to win. This time I really knew I would lose, but I was just hoping for a lucky something. So uh, I did better than I thought I was going to do, so I'm happy for that. But I still would have, you know, rather won, of course. But Now I know. Whoops, hold on one second. Ouch. Okay, be careful. Oh, you've had a lot of drama. Uh, coming up and stuff like that. Did that at all get in your head for this fight? Yeah, I mean, sure. You know, uh, you know, fighting is a, a mental game, so you want to always have everything going as smooth as possible before a fight. So I have a lot of stress, you know. I'm going to go to jail and, uh, for a year next week. And, uh, you know, I, I just don't want to go to jail because <laughs> it's going to be boring, you know. I can't train. I can't fight. I can't, I can't get laid, you know what I mean? <laughs> I mean, nothing's. I can't even have delicious snacks, no pizza, nothing, you know what I mean? So it's going to suck, but, I mean, I'm not worried nothing else. I don't think anyone's going to try and mess with me, I mean. It's county jail, it's not prison. So everyone there is a year or less, so they all want to go home too. So I don't expect, and I'm not in a gang, so there's no reason for people to mess with me. I'm just going to mind my own business, read some books. Uh, I'm going to just do push-ups and sit-ups and all that kind of stuff. Um, any last thing you want to say to the fans out there? All uh, right, thanks, thanks for uh, sticking by me. And, uh, you know, I'll be back in a year, and uh, I'll be in shape, and I'll, have, I'll do good fights. So. <laughs> He was initially meant to serve exactly one year in jail, yet would go on to serve over two, as the judge extended his sentence due to preceding street fights that came to light. He was made to serve a large majority of his time in solitary confinement for undisclosed reasons, and he was released directly from solitary onto the streets on October 29, 2012. He conceptualized a clothing brand during his incarceration, and would launch it with a friend just days after his release. He also started a video diary on social media, where he virtually admitted to taking steroids and at times came across as completely unhinged and maniacal. Oh my fucking God, I'm so fucking pissed off right now. <laughs> Dude, I've been craving a fucking Slurpee since last night. I want a Slurpee. I want a fucking Slurpee. And I, and, and I see 7-Eleven, so I go and I want to get a Slurpee. And I fill out my fucking cup and the fucking bitch who fucking works there fucking tells me I need to take off my fucking hoodie on my head. I was like, what? Huh? And the fucking bitch tells me that I have to fucking take off my hoodie or she's not gonna fucking serve me a fucking Slurpee. You fucking serious? Oh my god, I'm so I'm fucking freaked the fuck out. And then the fucking other asshole that works there says he's gonna call the cops. I wanna I'm so I'm all oh, I wanna smash the fucking motherfucker. So I went so I fucking I dumped my fucking Slurpee on the floor <laughs> so those fucking dumb motherfuckers could clean it up. Why? Oh my god, I'm so fucking mad. Jesus Christ. Why can't I just get a fucking Slurpee? Why Why that motherfuckers gotta harass me and tell me to take off my fucking hoodie? I'm gonna go to this other 7 Eleven right now. I'm gonna get a fucking Slurpee right now. And these motherfuckers better not tell me to take off my fucking hoodie. And they better not give me a hard fucking time. These motherfuckers. Oh my god, this motherfucker better not fucking tell me to take off my fucking hoodie. I'm gonna snap. Oh, fucking A. Look what I got, Slurpee. Look at my hood still on. <laughs> yeah, you know what, man? I'm fucking really glad this fucking dickhead right here, he, he sold me a Slurpee because if that motherfucker wouldn't have given me a Slurpee, then. I'd have had to boycott fucking 7-Eleven and all Slurpees. And I, I don't like to boycott Slurpees. What's up, guys? Yeah, I got some time to talk about this TRT shit right now. First of all, fucking any fighter that, that tries to get a TRT exemption is, is, is stupid. Because now you're telling them you're doing it. You know what I mean? Now, like, you know what I mean? You're better off just to shut up about it. Steroids aren't magic. You know what I mean? It, 
most all athletes do it, and they do it because they want to be the best. They want to do the best, and plus everyone else is doing it. So it's it, it, it's like, what are you going to do? What are you going to do, you know? You can't do shit about it, you know? Hey, yo, fuck 24-hour fitness, man. Oh, my God, I'm fucking about to freak the fuck out. I just left my fucking workout. This fucking, so I'm working out. I'm doing fucking um, uh, weighted pull-ups, 24-hour uh, fitness, and I'm using, you know, a chalk. Because I, I go heavy, like, I'm doing like 105 pounds and fucking it slips, you know, you see me chalk. Uh, and some of this fucking, this fucking like little fucking old skinny white fucking little bitch, this little man. I'm like, I'm like chalking my hands and I fucking walk up. I walk up to the, uh. Lunk alarm. He's like, he goes, hey, chalk's not allowed in this gym. And I was like, what? He's like, oh shit. I, like, I don't give a fuck. He's like, he's like, oh, you don't give a fuck? I said, I don't give a fuck. Let's get the fuck out of my way, motherfucker. And he's like, oh, I've been here for six years. I said, I don't give a fuck. I don't give a fuck. Get the fuck out of my way. Get the fuck out of my way. Get the fuck. I said, like, motherfucker, you better get the fuck out of my fucking way. Oh, if I wasn't on probation, I would smash his fucking face. If it was the old days, oh my God, dude. And then I'm wearing my fucking, I do alpha male shit, fucking shirt, and my tank top and shit. And he's like, oh, also, your shirt has profanity. I said, motherfucker. I said, shit is not a fucking cuss word and i was like hey man i said you're fucking I said, you're taking too far motherfucker I said, you're taking too fucking far i said i'm gonna freak the fuck out said, the fuck out of my fucking face i said i'm gonna finish your fucking workout and then i'm gonna fucking cancel membership I said, the fuck out of my face i'm gonna freak i'm gonna snap i'm gonna snap oh yeah so i, I go down uh downstairs to check out and i tell the chick like hey where's your little bitch ass manager <laughs> and she looked at me all crazy and then i and then i went into the manager office she's like oh i'm really sorry i was like i don't give a fuck i said get the fuck out of my fucking face right fucking now i don't give a fuck i don't give a fuck get the fuck out of my face don't talk to me again in your fucking life Oh my god, dude. All right. I'm fucking pissed. Oh, hey, go to alphamilshit.com and buy some shit. Because fucking, why not? Because it's good shit. And because, I don't know. I want to make money. Because I'm broke. It was okay. guys. <laughs> True. <It> was, <laughs> I was watching the, the video from last night. And I was freaking out about that uh, 24 hour fitness stuff. It makes me look like a fucking maniac. <laughs> but. Yeah? I was fucking pissed, for real. I'm on probation, and, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, I can't act the way I, that I used to act, you know, like a, like a law maniac, like I want to, you know, like, so I think this is going to be kind of good, like, the uh, stupid, um, the little video blogs, because then, you know, I could, like, kind of vent, you know, it's kind of like a diary, like a journal or whatever, I don't have to freak out and, and smash people instead, you know? kind of good and it's, it's kind of funny you know <clears throat> so when i watch it when i watch it uh i'm like fuck dude i look like a fucking psychomania but that's all i get man i get so fucking pissed off you know so pissed off but that guy was a dick though i don't, I don't know i don't know what that guy's problem was he was highly active on social media and his intense albeit controversial views seemed to recapture his fan base to a considerable degree for the first six months after his release from prison rather than training to be a professional fighter he mainly vlogged and focused on his brand while posting the majority of his content to myspace every day he would post a fresh cover photo without exception and each image consisted of a scenic background with an inspirational message glazed over it this became almost habitual activity and those who were following John's account could expect a new picture at around midnight every night. However, on Tuesday the 9th of April 2013, the routine procedure abruptly ceased, and for four days, his social media went completely silent. On Sunday the 14th, he would post just one cover photo, but then withdrew completely from all social media platforms for almost two weeks. This caused both his followers and the MMA community to speculate on his whereabouts, with many asserting he had gone back to prison for violating his parole, while others stated he was on the run for a drug charge. But he wasn't on the run, and he wasn't in prison. The rumors were quashed on Friday the 26th at exactly 4.34 p.m., as John's social media would once again come alive and see him post multiple times a day, every day. Only this time he wasn't posting melodramatic quotes lifted from Google Images, as it appeared...
picture was 22-year-old Christy McInday, who at the time was a leading figure in the adult film industry. She rose to stardom in 2012 when she first began as a performer, and her profile continued to skyrocket uh, as she hit... Nothing bad is going to happen, right? They wouldn't show anything not safe for Twitch on this YouTube channel, right? 2640 to 27. Yeah, I see this. Okay. The mainstream avenues. Her and Copenhaver met on a photo shoot for Hustler magazine. It's okay. They're, they're standing in a hot tub. It, beneath it. You can't see it, but I know the rest of this picture, okay? Spring of 2013 and struck up a relationship two weeks later. John went back to fighting and restored his winning streak, while Christy continued to rise in the world of adult entertainment. They both seemed to elevate each other's profiles simultaneously and made several public appearances at award ceremonies and media outlets. They began receiving brand deals as a couple and were even in talks with Bravo TV about starting their own reality show. Their crossing of paths appeared to align the stars. Everything started falling into place and the future looked promising. Yet the bright outlook on their flourishing careers and the prospect of being rich and famous would fade into trivial insignificance when compared to the extraordinary rush of falling in love. Okay, hold on. RTBI says this is safe for you guys. One thing that people understand, yet always seem to forget, is that you never truly know what goes on behind closed doors. Things aren't always as they seem, and the manner in which couples often present their lives in public can be a stark contrast to the reality when no one is watching. This is extremely common in abusive relationships and will often be an unspoken agreement between the abused and the abuser. They will each maintain the pleasing facade while hiding the ugly truth. The abuser's public image will often be an outright contradiction to their true self, while the abused will happily play along as they can escape into fantasy and pretend it's all real for a few brief moments. A prolonged abusive relationship requires both parties to live vicariously through the perceptions of others. It would come to light that violence was a common occurrence in Christy and John's relationship, with Christy being on the receiving end of it each and every time. She would eventually break things off in May 2014, but John kept a key to her apartment and showed up unannounced three months later to find her in bed with another man. That man was 35-year-old Corey Thomas, who was then beaten to a bloody pulp for roughly 10 minutes and suffered a dislocated shoulder, broken nose, and bite mark to the face. He was then put in a chokehold and made to swear that he wouldn't go to the authorities, at which point he gave John his word and was then let go. Copenhaver then set himself on Christie for almost two hours. She was raped, severely beaten, and cut with a knife. Her injuries included 18 broken bones in her face, 12 missing teeth, three rib fractures, and a severely ruptured liver. Once her attacker's back was turned, she managed to escape out the balcony and stagger to a neighbor's garden where she was soon rescued by police. Officers then raided the apartment, but Copenhaver was nowhere to be found. He went on the run for over a week and posted tweets the entire time, basically professing how misunderstood and unfairly treated he was. He was eventually tracked down to a motel in Simi Valley, California and taken into custody. He was held without bond at the Clark County Detention Center for two and a half years awaiting trial. He pleaded not guilty to all 34 charges laid against him, which included one count of first-degree rape and two counts of attempted murder. His trial commenced on February 27th of 2017. Now, you will hear that all of a sudden while they're sleeping, this door comes open, the lights turn on, and the defendant is standing there. Both of them are shocked. They both kind of sit up in the bed. The defendant looks at Corey. He runs to Corey. He jumps on the bed and he starts wailing on his face. Hit after hit after hit after hit. Corey sticks up his hands to protect himself and then the defendant begins to choke him. Now, Christy, knowing that this is what the defendant does, very quickly hops out of bed and puts the two dogs out because the defendant has been violent towards her dogs in the past. She puts those dogs out she then runs to the bathroom, she takes her cell phone, and she makes a 911 call.
You'll have that 911 call back in evidence and be able to hear it clear. Ms. McIngay will tell you that at one point she wakes up, she's lying on her back, her legs are spread out in front of the defendant, excuse my language, and he says, that's my pussy and I'm going to take it back. He then licks his hand, places it on her vagina in an attempt to lubricate it as he tries to get himself hard but he's not able to do so, and that makes him angry, so he continues to beat her. Ladies and gentlemen, at the end of this trial, after you see all of the items of evidence, after you hear the testimony of Corey Thomas, and after you hear the testimony of Christine McIndae, the state will ask you to go in, deliberate, come back, and find the defendant guilty of the crimes in which the state has charged him. I want to ask you a couple questions about an individual by the name of Christine McIndae. Do you know her? Yes. And how is it that you know her? <clears throat> uh, we dated. Tell me about that first date. How did it go? Went great. We met each other and you know got acquainted with each other and had some dinner about 7 p.m. Did you um, discuss any of her previous boyfriends at that time? Yeah, we, you kind of discussed that you know in, in the beginning opening day. Okay. Uh, she had mentioned that her. her Previous boyfriend happened to be an MMA fighter. Uh, what was your understanding of her relationship with the MMA fighter previous boyfriend? Oh, she said. Wait, hold on, what? Oh, stop. They had no relationship. They'd been over for six months. So then the door opened uh, to the room, and the lights came on, and the defendant was standing there looking at me. Is that individual present in the courtroom today? Yes. Can you point to him and describe something he's wearing? Oh, sure. Purple shirt, war machine. So the lights went on at that time, and then you were able to see his face? Yeah. Describe to me the expression on his face. A very surprised, big eye, um, very angry look. And could see him say the words, what the fuck? What happens after he mouths those words to you? So I um, thought to myself, wow, what's... What's going to happen next? I remember trying to put my hands onto the bed and kind of slide to up t towards the sitting position. But before I could get there, he had already jumped onto the bed from there to there, and he had started pounding me in the face. And where was he striking you? In the face. With what? With his knuckles, closed fist. Okay. Um, did he land any of those hits? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, what's going through your mind at this time? Uh cover my face, but um, then I was just receiving hits right to the face, probably 10, 15 good, fast, quick hits. And I just covered, I started to cover my face as fast as possible and get my hands up, but they were still slipping in. You know, I mean, it's, the guy's a fighter, so it's like, you can't cover everything. And um, I thought to myself, okay, I gotta break him from hitting me. And I reached up, I grabbed him behind the neck with my right hand, and I pulled him down to flatten him out so he had to put his hands out though so as he's coming down then he bit me here in the cheek okay and I could feel the bite and once it registered I was getting bitten then I put my hands back up to try and break him off of my face and then he bit me in the arm as I was trying to push him up off of me and then he's still hitting me um, slipping in a lot, a lot of hits so um, I use my feet and my hands to push him away from me and I stepped off to the left side of the bed. I tried to roll over to the, to the side of the bed and then he came lunging at me and immediately went for my neck from behind and put a choke <coughs> around my neck. Uh, my head is about here, body's like this. He's choking me that way and I'm looking up at the ceiling thinking to myself, oh my God, I'm not gonna die in Chrissy's bathroom. What were you feeling uh, as he's choking you? I was starting to see stars and go unconscious. It was on my way. So then I, I thought to myself, well, I'm, I'm physically done. I think the only thing left here is I got it, to mentally try and change the table and see what's, what's possible. And I just asked a simple question. I said, well, what do you want from me? Do you want to kill me? Or do you want me to walk out of here? What was his response? At first it was, you know, not really a response, just a just a, 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 a pause. Then he moved into threatening me and telling me, well, my friends are Hell's Angels and my friends are Navy SEALs and, you know, how do I know if I let you go, you're not going to be a snitch? Did you tell him whether or not you would snitch? Yeah, I, I said, well, I'm no snitch. Okay. So that's, that's that. 
you know, if we make an agreement to to handle this and this is over, then that's what it is. Okay. But um, he threatened me again, and and I said, well, you got really two options: you got to kill me, or you got to let me go. And I kind of tried to just change the table, and I could feel him kind of release a little bit. I got to a, my feet and walked around the bed. I grabbed my things from this side of the bed. I looked at him, he looked at me, we nodded at each other, and I said, okay, and, and I walked out the door. I went up to the other room where we were last night, grabbed the rest of my stuff, and I walked right back out, down the stairs to the front door, and left. Were you able to, um, did you land any punches on him? No. No? And why not? Because I was busy getting punched. Okay. When you were leaving Ms. Mack's residence... This guy seems so chill. Did you... Um, here, uh, I wonder if it hurts his testimony in the eyes of the jury because of how chill he is. Because this guy is just like, yeah, man, I don't know. I thought he was going to fucking kill me. And then he didn't. And I fucking bounced. And um, yeah, you know, what are you going to do? I went to 7-Eleven after and I got a Slurpee because, you know, he recommended me one on the way out. Like, he's just like super chill. He's just like, which is like, whatever. Any screaming or yelling between... Either the defendant or Ms. McIndoe? No. Uh, could you hear anything that made you believe that there was um, further violence going on in that house? From from hearing anything? No. Because in my mind, I mean, I mean, I would never, you know, it's, hitting a girl is not something that I would ever be able to understand doing. So, and in my mind, hit. What did you say? Hitting a girl. Hitting. Girl. Yeah, I was raised with three three sisters. My mom, my, my mother, and that's not something that would process in my mind so I thought two guys fought that's the end of it and you know I'm spent I'm sure he is and move forward um do you have quite an affinity for animals yes I do right. do you, you have several pets yes so during this time period that we're going to talk about in a little bit which would be August of 2014 can you explain um how many animals you had and you know what kind of animal they were um I have two dogs and I had I believe five snakes at that time, and I had some rats, and um, John and I had shared two ferrets. Okay. Um, you said you used the term John. Uh, who's that? And you refer to him as War Machine. Okay. And was he your boyfriend at one time? Yes. Okay. Do you see him in the courtroom today? Yes, I do. Can you please um, just describe an article of clothing that he's wearing for me? He's wearing a white button-up shirt. Okay. Um, Your Honor, may the record reflect that she's identified the defendant? Yes, it will. Thank you. So we were speaking about the defendant just a second ago. Um, how was it that you met him? Um, we met at an adult shoot for Hustler, um, and it was just a it was just a like a photograph spread for Hustler magazine. Was it your like? Did you have an appointment to do the photo shoot at Hustler, or did he? How did that work out? He did. They had asked him to do the shoot, and he said I would only do it if you got Christy to do it. Okay. Did you know him at that point? No, I did not. Um, and so you agreed to do the shoot? Yes. And so um, the two of you obviously must have hit it off? Um, yeah, a little bit. Um, I was very standoffish. Um, I didn't want a relationship. I was very, I felt very independent and I didn't want a man at that time. Okay. Um, but at some point you came into a relationship, right? Yes, we did. And so when was that? Um, just a few weeks after. When you started dating, how old were you? I believe I was 22. And how old was he? That would make him 32. What types of things, like when you, you know, when the relationship was going well, what types of things did the two of you do for fun? Um, we would go to movies. We would just go to the park, drive around sometimes. Um, I don't like being in crowds. Um, I have really bad social anxiety, so it makes me uncomfortable. Um, and I was going to ask you, are you somewhat of a, a homebody? Yes, definitely. Um, and do you drink? Not at all. Do you do any drugs? Never. Um, and so, Mr. Copenhaver, did he did that lifestyle match with him as well? Um, for a while it seemed that it did, but at times it definitely did not suit him at all. If I were to ask you, like, how would you explain your relationship? What would you say? Um, our relationship was definitely very, very passionate. Um, 
and at times very violent, but sometimes extremely loving. Did the defendant go quickly to anger um, during the fights? Um, usually, yes. Um, at some point in your relationship, did, did you start to see an angry side of him? Yes, I did. In the beginning, or when you first started seeing this side to him, um, was the violence physical? Not in the beginning. Okay, can you explain the, how it was? Um, in the beginning, he would remove himself from the situation. Did it get to a point um, where when he got angry, he wasn't leaving the room anymore? Yes. Um, and did there start to become physical violence in your relationship? Yes, they did. When, when did that start happening? Um, I want to say three or four months in. In the beginning, it would just be like a slap in the face, and that would be it, or just choking me, and that would be it. When he would do this, I just, I'm going to give a personal opinion here for how I feel. It might not necessarily be, no, I would stand by this opinion. I think that there is more similarity. If, if I could draw three, par like three points of violent behavior where one point is no violence, the next point is slapping someone, and then the next point is beating the shit out of somebody until they're almost dead. If beating the shit out of somebody is 100 and no violence at all is a zero, I think slapping somebody on the face is like 85. I think that anybody that has the propensity to be violent in a relationship, getting them to the point to where they're like beating the shit out of you, I don't think is that far. I think that there is, I don't think there is, I don't think there's a such thing as somebody that can be just like a little violent in a relationship. I think that if they have the propensity to actually, and when I say like hit, I don't mean like they like push you out of their way when they're like leaving the room or, or something like that or whatever. I mean like somebody will like open hand slap you or punch you. I think that you, I think that at that point you've crossed a line and you're, that needs, you're done. That, that relationship is over. That is just completely, completely, completely not, you're just, you're so, so, so over the line at that point. Was your breathing impeded? Yes, it was. Um, would you like see stars or lose consciousness? Usually, yes. Usually you would lose consciousness? Yes. How often were these types of things happening, like the slaps or the chokes? At first, they, they weren't. Do you think being slapped is ever acceptable in a relationship? Um... I would say no, but like there, depending on the type of relationship you have, it's possible that there's like joking stuff or whatever, which is different. Um, that, so that's like obviously a different thing. But if there is a case where somebody is just like, just slaps the shit out of like, j or just like just slaps somebody because something they do, I think that that's, I think that that's not, oh, I think you're way over the line. I think you're way, 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 way over the line at that point. weren't that frequent, maybe once a month. Um, but as our relationship progressed, the violence progressed also. Um, did you ever fight back? No. No, your mom lives with you in your home in Las Vegas. Yes, she did. And you said that the defendant hated your mom. Yes. And was there a constant, um, I mean, it went both ways, is that fair to say? Yes, it did. They, they both hated each other. When he would do these things to you, like these choking events or slapping events, um, would he ever take any personal property from you? He would usually take my phone. And why would he take your phone? He was afraid that I was going to call my mom. Why would that scare him if you called your mom? Because my mom would call the police. Do you feel comfortable telling your mom or your friends that these types of things were happening to you? No, um, I hid it from my mom the best I could. Um, I don't like my mom to worry about me, and then I also didn't want her to call the police. Were you were you embarrassed that these things were happening to you? I was extremely embarrassed. I never thought that I could let that happen to me. Um, I always saw myself as a strong individual, and um, I realize now that I shouldn't have been embarrassed, but at the time I definitely was. Did he ever threaten you if you did tell? Yes, he did. What did he say? Um, he, would, he said he would send his Navy SEAL friends and the Hells Angels after 
either myself or my family if he went to if he went to prison. Christie recounts four graphic occurrences of her getting physically assaulted by the defendant, with the fourth being over another guy designing her gold-plated fangs. He he ripped my wig off and I took my fangs out. What? He ripped my leg off? I heard that right. Designing her gold-plated fangs. He he ripped my wig off and wig. She's saying wig. Does it sound like lig a little bit? Wig lig over another guy designing gold-plated fangs. He, he ripped my wig off. Wig is what she said. And I took right. my fangs out because I knew he was going to hit me next. The Annie or Laurel? No, sorry. I didn't no, want sorry. to either chip my teeth or swallow one of the fangs. Okay. So you took them out? What yes. happened after you took the fangs out? Um, I put them into my bag and he began screaming at me more and more and he turned the car around to go back where we came from. I had taken my seatbelt off because I knew if we hit a stoplight, I'd be able to escape and I wouldn't have to get hit this time. Okay. So um, I took my seatbelt off without him noticing and I tried, when we reached the stoplight, thank God we hit, it, we hit a stoplight, I opened the door to try and escape and he pulled me back in by my hair and slammed my head down on the dashboard, which chipped my tooth. And then he was still really mad, so he grabbed my head and brought me in and bit my chin right here. In the left part of your bottom chin? Yes. And uh, and I don't remember how many times he hit me after that, but he turned down the side road by the Best Buy and he said, now I have to kill you because people saw you trying to escape. He said, now I have to take you to the desert to kill you. I, was st I still have my seatbelt off. I was bent over crying. And at some point he punched me in the back. Um, and then he took me to a gym parking lot and he calmed down a little bit and uh, he, he licked his hand and tried to wipe some of the blood away. He told me he couldn't take me home like this because my mom was home. Um, and he told me he had to clean me up but everything was gonna be fine. Um, and then after that he took me home. He went inside first. Um, when my mom greeted him, she, he said that I was just, you know, um, getting some stuff out of the car and then I would be in shortly. And then when she went back to her room, he allowed me to come in and go upstairs and clean myself up. What were your injuries after that incident? Um, I, had, I had a black eye and I had a cut under my eye. I had a scratch on my nose where he had hit me. Um, I had a bite mark here. Um, and that, that's pretty much it, my chipped tooth. Um, I once told my mom, you know, I, was just, I just fell down the stairs in my bedroom. Um, of course, the, the cliche, I fell down the stairs, um, but I, I ended up using that. Um, I told my friends that you know, it was just a dog scratch or, you know, my dogs are large, that a dog had hit me in the head, like head butted me, like it was, I would just come up with any excuse that I could use. You said in the days afterwards, um, he would take care of you. So let's say that, you know, there's, there's an incident um, like we were just talking about. Um, and then you have marks on your face. In the next days, how would he treat you? It would be the best days of our relationship. He would stay home from training just to be with me. And uh, he would, we would watch all my favorite movies. He would go to the store and get all the snacks that I wanted. He would go get coffee for me. We would order, you know, take in a delivery. Um, he would just be around me and make sure that I was okay. Was he loving during those periods? Extremely loving. This is known in psychology as the cycle of abuse, or more specifically, phase three, sometimes referred to as the honeymoon stage. After an abusive episode, the abuser will often seek connection. They will act romantic, apologetic, and remorseful. The abused will primarily feel relief in that they are no longer being attacked, but they may also begin to feel a stronger connection to the abuser due to the abrupt switch of contrasting emotions. When intense fear and intimidation is directly followed by affection and warmth, the intimate nature of the latter can become significantly intensified. The abused will then feel reassured and hopeful about the relationship, and this denial approves the illusion of safety. During therapy, the counselor will often refer to this as the merry-go-round. The reason for this is because the cheerful image of an amusement ride is believed to make it less intimidating, and therefore easier to both spot and then accept when the cycle of abuse is occurring. Christy then goes on to graphically recount just one of the multiple times she was raped by the defendant. When this is going on, are you, you know, are you saying anything? Are you fighting? 
I start by saying, no, please don't. Like, I don't want this to happen. And then I just give up. Did you make clear to him that I, I, this is not what I want? Yes, I did. I began crying at some point. Um, I tell him, stop. And then I just lay there. After it was done, how, how did it end? Um, he got off and then I went to the shower and, and just kept crying. And he started screaming at me, what the fuck's wrong with you? After this event happened, um, did you still maintain a, a relationship with him? Yes, I did. Why did you continue to stay with him when these things were being done to you? I loved him. Um, I would have done anything for him. I, I just wanted to be with him. Another hour of testimony goes by where Christy details multiple occurrences of physical and psychological abuse. She eventually gets to the moment when Corey Thomas had just left the apartment after being assaulted by Copenhaver. Now you said that after Corey leaves you remember the defendant running at you. Yes. And then you remember the next thing you remember is being in the shower. Yes. Do you remember how you got in the shower? I don't know how I got in the shower. Do you remember um, when you were in the shower did you have clothes on or off? They were off. Um, and the, the shorts that I were wearing were in the shower. When you were in the shower, uh, what was the defendant doing? He was going through my phone and yelling at me through the glass door. What was he yelling about? I don't remember exactly what he was yelling about anymore. At that point in time, do you, did you think you had been hit? Yes, um, I could taste blood in my mouth. So I knew I had been hit in the face. And I also have, I don't remember how I got in the shower. What's the next thing you remember? Um, past that. I went to, I just remember being on all fours right in front of the shower, uh, like I was about to stand up, and he kicked me in the ribs so hard that I fell over and began convulsing. Did you ever ask him for help or to stop? Just after this, um, I told him that I needed help. Because I, I genuinely felt like I was going to die at this point. What did he say to you? He told me that nobody could help me. At any point in time, did he um, <clears throat> ever use any weapons against you? Yes, he did. Can he, you explain how? He had a knife. Um, it was one of my, my kitchen set knives. It was a black handle with silver rivets. And um, he would push it into my ear. He would push it into my hand. He sawed off my hair. Um, he cut up all of my wigs because he always hated my wigs. He, he cut my head. With the knife? Yes. I just remember him still being so angry. He broke the handle off of the knife and still continued to use the knife blade um, in his hand to push it into me. Does, is there come a point where he tells you that he's going to have to kill you? Yes. What does he say? He looks at me and he says, now I have to kill you. I've gone too far. I, you can't be seen like this. Everyone's going to know. Copenhaver then goes downstairs to the kitchen to retrieve another blade, at which point Christy gets to her feet, staggers to her first story balcony, and jumps off. She then musters the strength to make her way down to the end of the street, where her neighbor spots her hiding in the garden and calls 911. Christy was taken to the hospital and treated for her injuries. The horrific images circulated on... Okay, hold on social media and the hashtag war machine began trending in the United States, Canada, Brazil, and the United Kingdom. The mugshot of the perpetrator became the most retweeted image during the second week of August 2014, and this eventually led to his arrest. The trial was a hot topic in the national news, with each of the elements receiving a considerable amount of coverage, yet the most talked about was Aaron McIndae. Christie's mother. She would testify on day seven of the trial and managed to come across as both endearing yet intimidating at the same time. The type of person you would want as a friend, but most certainly would not want as your enemy. Just briefly, like, how would you characterize Christie? What type of child was she? She was a very quiet child. She liked to keep to herself. She was very loving. Um, she was very creative. She liked to color and draw and play with Barbies. And she... How did she do in school? She was outstanding in school. I never had to stand over her and say, do your homework. It was an automatic thing for her. 
Um, would you say she's an extrovert or an introvert? I would say introvert for sure. As far as you know, um, does she drink alcohol? No. Um, or, or did she drink never. alcohol? Never. She's never had alcohol. Um, what about drugs? No. In 2013, did Christine start dating someone um, by the name of Jonathan Copenhaver? Yes. Do you see him here? I do. He's wearing a white shirt, playing oh. with his fingers. Okay. Your Honor, may the record reflect the identification of the defendant? Yes, it will. Thank you. Now, uh, does he look the same to you as he sits here today? No. How does he look different? He looks like he's lost about 50, 60 pounds. He's not as broad in the arms and in the shoulders. Um, did you start to see any changes in Christine after she had been with him yes. for a few months? Yes. Can you please describe some of those changes? She was more isolated from me. She didn't want to do anything with me. She would spend more time in her room. Um, she wasn't as talkative. Uh, her social media, one of her accounts was closed. She was more of an, she's always been independent. Even as a little girl, she was independent. And you could see her independence kind of slip away as time went on. Were you ever present uh, at the home when the defendant became physically violent towards your daughter. I was in that room that day, and I heard screaming and fighting. And I came out of my bedroom, and I said, what the F is going on? They're screaming at each other. I don't even, I can't even remember what they were screaming, but Christy was standing up on the stairs. I'm not sure where John was. And she said he grabbed me by my neck and drug me up the stairs. And I'm like, I'm calling the police. And you could see she had a red mark on her throat. So he, said, I, I'm sorry, when she said that to you, when she said he grabbed me by my throat, is she talking like you and I are talking or is- No, she was screaming, she was hysterical. Okay. I think at that point, John had gone up to the bedroom to pack his stuff. Cause when I said, I'm calling the police, he, he's leaving. And he stood in the closet with his laundry bag taking his clothes and stuffing it in there going, I'm going to kill you. I'm going to kill you. I'm going to kill you. Was the relationship be between the defendant and you, um, it had it pretty much deteriorated? Yes. Um, and because of that was, was Christy often kind of in the middle between the two of you? Yes. Was it clear at this point that you didn't like him? And oh, I couldn't like stand you? him at that point. I didn't like him. And I, I told Christy, you know, I started noticing things and I told her my opinion and it was just, she'd say, I don't want to talk about it. I don't want to talk about it. And then at 6.44, um, you receive a text message from the defendant. You awake yet? Several question marks. There was a huge fight when I came in. The guy she was in bed with came at me. So when you start getting these text messages, Oh, you know, what do you do? What's going through your mind? I tried to call him because I couldn't text fast enough. I just woke up. I was trying to read those and try to process out of a straight sleep. What am I looking at? What I'm, my mind's trying to catch up to everything that's going on. And so I tried to call him and I said, what's going on? And he goes, we got into a fight and I had to beat her up. And, and from that point on, I just, I think I hung up the phone. I went and told my boyfriend, you've got to get up now. He's done something to Christy. Move your car <coughs> so I can get across town. My boyfriend said, oh God. So did you get in your car and go across town? He moved Christy? his car and I started driving. And I think the next time I had a thought, I was actually underneath the desert in the viaduct, the, the bridge on DI. Okay. Do you know what I'm talking yes, about? I think that's the last cognitive thought that I really had from the house to there. And my thought was, she's dead. That did, was my thought. Did you get to Christie's house? I did. And when you got there, um, were there already police officers and everything? Yes, ma'am. And what did you do? Um, I stopped my truck in the street. I got out of my truck. I saw that the front door was open. I started running. There were officers outside of the house trying to tell me to stop. There were some officers inside the house and I made it as far as to the inside door. And it was almost like I was like 
face to face with a lady police officer. And um, she looked at me and I looked at her and I said, is my daughter dead? And she just looked at me and she said, no, she's at Sunrise Hospital. I get to the ER and I said, I'm Christy Max, mom, I wanna see my daughter. And I walked in and she was laid in the bed and it didn't look like her. And I walked around and I grabbed her hand. And she said, please don't cry. So I squatted down underneath the bed so I wouldn't upset her. And I held her hand and I cried. <laughs> While you were speaking with Christy, um, did you attempt to help her find something that she was looking for? Yes. And what was that? Her cell phone. Did you text the defendant and ask him for it? Christy told me that he had taken her cell phone. And so I started sending him text messages that I wanted that fucking phone. Were you ever able to get the cell phone? No. If looks could kill. According to the Journal of Neuroscience, the mother and daughter relationship is the strongest of all bonds. The part of the brain that regulates emotion is more similar between mothers and daughters than any other intergenerational pairing. And this means a mother is more able to put herself in her daughter's shoes when facing a problem, and thus empathize with her struggle to a far greater extent. Was, um, without talking about your conversations with Christy, was, were there, was there a folder on Christy's phone that she specifically wanted you to get? Yes. Uh, <clears throat> for... Is that true? I have no idea. Could be, I don't know. Remainder of Christy stayed at the hospital and then for several weeks after, um, did you kind of try to keep her in a safe place in, a, in hiding? Yes. Uh, until the defendant had been apprehended? Yes. You talked a little bit about uh, Christy when you came to her in the hospital and started crying. She told you to, she told you to quit crying. Um, Yes, I'm sorry. It's okay. I know it's hard, but I need an out loud answer. Would you consider her an emotional person? No. Do you consider it easy for her to share things? No. In regards to this incident, um, does she talk, want to talk about it? No. <coughs> because of the instance that you've spoken about, you know, that you, you had seen the defendant physically violent, um, and because you saw your daughter with marks and you had concerns, do you regret now, you know, not stepping in and going to the police? No. Mm -mm. The other incidents that I saw, I really wish I would have shot you. Jesus. That's my retrospective. I wish I would have shot you. Thank you so much. So that concludes my direct examination. Cross. <clears throat> the trial lasted three weeks, and the verdict came in on March 20th, 2017. Verdict. We, the jury in the above title case, find the defendant, War Machine, a.k.a. Jonathan Copenhaver, as follows. Count one, battery constituting domestic violence strangulation, ferret cage. Guilty of battery constituting, constituting domestic violence. Court, count two, coercion. Guilty of coercion without force. Count three, preventing or dissuading witness or victim from reporting crime or commencing prosecution. Guilty of preventing or dissuading witness of or victim from reporting crime or commencing prosecution.
The jury deadlocked on the two counts of attempted murder, but Copenhaver was still convicted on 29 others, including kidnapping and sexual assault with a weapon. He was sentenced on June 5, 2017. Erin McAday and her daughter, Christy McAday, both made brief statements before the sentencing of Jonathan Copenhaver, the 35-year-old mixed martial arts fighter known as War Machine. I don't know if my life will feel complete in 12 years, or 20 years, or even 30 years. And neither do you. I have to look out for the uh, well-being of the community and avoid possible danger to future potential victims as I uh, consider the appropriate sentence here. Copenhaver was ordered to serve 36 years to life after being convicted of more than two dozen charges, including sexual assault and first-degree kidnapping. So there you have it, the rise and fall of John War Machine Copenhaver. It's a human paradox that many of us will only consider the big picture once it's already too late. He will more than likely spend the rest of his life in prison, and in reverse to the wonder of being able to create memories in the future, he now has to make do with the ones he's got, the mountaintops and the valleys. Only the mountains will never have seemed as high, and the valleys won't appear nearly as Thanks for watching X. <laughs> what a weird... Well... Had you really never heard of that Big Brother show? Of this one? No. But I, I didn't watch a lot of reality too. I just... I live life on the internet, okay? Damn.